Hello, everybody, and welcome uh, to PCI London Valve 2023. Today, we are uh, together with uh, two colleagues and friends to discuss uh, about TAVI pathway optimization. Together with me, there is Douglas Muir from James Cook University, Middlesbrough, UK, and uh, we, we have Dirk Frank from Kiel University, Germany. So let's start uh, our talk about uh, TAVI optimization. Uh, why do you think, uh, Douglas, it is necessary to optimize the TAVI pathway? Well, we know about the aging population with a higher preponderance of calcific degenerative aortic valve disease. We know that guidelines have changed over the last few years so that more and more patients have been directed towards transcatheter therapy rather than surgical aortic valve replacement. And that puts a lot of strain on all our healthcare systems, no matter where you work. And it's important that we keep access uh, to these beneficial treatments for all patients. And the more we optimize the pathway, the more patients can be offered uh, life-changing and life-prolonging uh, life therapies. So talking about uh, TAVI optimization, uh, Dirk, uh, we, we have this uh, uh, project, research project, actually it's a clinical project called Benchmark. Can you explain what is it and a little bit what are the results, the main results of this? So the Benchmark program is a clinical program um, which focuses on TAVI optimization um, in the pre, peri and post-procedural TAVI phase. It's based on basically two trials, on the FAST TAVI trial and on the 3M trial. And it, it, comp it, it comprises um, 10 best practices, which are, as I mentioned, um, in part in the pre-procedural phase, like patient screening, TAVI coordinator, the periprocedural phase, and the post-procedural phase. And um, this program has been um, developed uh, since 2018, 2019, and implemented now in more than 100 centers all over um, Europe, very successfully. And um, the idea behind it is to, um, to bring a very safe, but very effective program in place. And we have also worked um, on, on clinical data um, to, to show the efficiency of uh, the benchmark program. And therefore, we started the benchmark registry in 2020, where we all together and some more colleagues um, um, set up a registry study where we had a retrospective and a prospective phase, which had a implementation phase of eight benchmark best practices right in the middle. So we could compare the pre and post implementation phases in order to see there was a primary endpoint, whether we could shorten the total length of stay. There was one part of the primary endpoint and the co-primary endpoint was also to reduce the need for intensified care beds, what we called it. So less ICU use, less IMC use, um, I think that's one of the most important things because uh, you mentioned it of the research shortage we are currently facing all over Europe and also elsewhere. Um, and I had the opportunity to present the data um, at um, Europe PCR a few months ago in Paris as a late breaking clinical trial and just to um, uh, put together the, the, the essential results. The trial was very positive in terms of the primary endpoint. So the um, length of stay, the total length of stay could be shortened by two full days. It means less, uh, a, a reduction of more than 25%. And also the use of intensified care um, unit beds was reduced from 1.9 to 1.3 days. It was very effective. And the co, <coughs> also important uh, co-secondary endpoint was patient safety and was fully uncompromised. Yeah, that's uh, absolutely great. And maybe I can add some Something that now we have also some uh, regional data because uh, you know the benchmark program was, I mean we were three investigators. We are three investigators. Uh, it was applied in different countries, different hospitals. So we investigated a little bit also what was uh, if there was any difference in the success of the this implementation in different countries. And what we can say now is that you know this investigation is quite reassuring in terms that the benchmark best practices are applicable, uh, let's say, in in different uh, uh, hospitals and regional uh, and different healthcare services and effective 
uh, and so uh, reproducible. So it's something that is, uh, uh, I think it's important as a message. Although, I mean, we know that uh, it was not the same in all the country, absolutely, but every the, there are tiny differences that should be investigated. Anyway, uh, you mentioned that there are three phases important of optimization. So pre-procedure, intra-procedure, post-procedure. Just focus on one. What is, for example, for the pre-procedural phase, what do you think is key? Key message for the hospital that want to start the TAVI optimization program? So I strongly believe in the concept of having a TAVI coordinator. A TAVI coordinator is, is a person which um, is truly responsible for the program. Basically, I think running the program, something like the heart of the program, taking care of uh, a lot of organization processes within the hospital and also outside the hospital. So the TAVI coordinator is a person who is um, the key contact person for the patient himself or herself, but also the family. <coughs> and just to, to, to highlight one of the pre-procedural best practices is that there is a, a, a meeting in place with the TAVI team and the TAVI coordinator and the patient ideally also with a relative where the whole pathway, the whole journey through the hospital is being discussed on the one hand. And on the other hand, during this meeting, we are also discussing the potential time of discharge. I think that's a very important point. So we are talking about the date of discharge before admission. I think this is very important. And uh, as you highlighted, the figure of the TAVI coordinator is a uh, is key figure. It's something that we actually should try to develop and to adopt in many centers because we know that in, in the world, in, in the European countries, there is not so easy, not all the, the, the hospital have this facility. This is something that we have to work on uh, to, to, to improve our pathway of care. And Douglas, what about the procedural phase and maybe the post-procedural, what do you think is yeah. key? I mean, the procedural phase in some ways is quite easy because there is nothing very exotic about the protocol, but it does rely on, for example, ultrasound puncture for all patients, all times, which I think is evidence-based. Uh, it also suggests uh, avoidance of deep sedation. Uh, so we recommend very strongly uh, light sedation or even no sedation. And I think ultrasound uh, can really help with local anaesthetic installation to reduce the need for extra strong pain relief, for example. And then perhaps the final thing that may not be uniquely um, practiced is to check the uh, groin access at the end, either by an ultrasound check or by an invasive angiogram. So the, the procedural phase, generally speaking, is all fairly straightforward. I think the post-procedural phase is really key and something that the TAVI nurse coordinator or clinical coordinator is uh, fundamental to, and that is ensuring that mobilization is done per protocol and early. So after four to six hours, patients can start to mobilize. And of course, you can only do that if the patient has not been deeply sedated, otherwise everything gets set back a long time. And if you work to these protocols, it's very common that you can get your patient home on post-operative day one. So the day after the procedure, it's very uh, reproducible that patients can go home. And as Dirk mentioned earlier on, safely. We saw that very clearly in the registry. There was no signal whatsoever of any uh, hazard from this protocol, despite the shorter lengths of stay, which are really quite clinically meaningful. What do you think about uh, conduction disturbances? I know this is often an issue for hospitals that want to start uh, you know, uh, such a program. Yeah. Do you, have, uh, oh, dear, do you have any message specific about that? Well, I think one message is that Benchmark is designed of, around data about uh, balloon expandable systems. So you can't completely have the same protocol necessarily for every system that you use because the pacemaker rate and the conduction rate could be different. But I think uh, there are protocols that our Edwards team will help to supply that uh, help to streamline conduction problems so that they're a bit more predictably uh, managed and that it's a bit less randomly decided by, for example, the, the ward cardiologist what to do about a new left bundle branch block or a transient conduction disturbance. So protocolization really helps. So basically standardization uh, of management, you know, consistent management yes. of uh, conduction disturbances that may be applied also to self-expanding world, but uh, maybe with some adjustment 
So I think, uh, I mean, we, we highlighted uh, what is uh, important today. So TAVI optimization is important and why it's uh, important because you know, we, we need also to reduce waiting lists uh, and to you know, increase the capability to offer this therapy to patients. Uh, I, I think we can strongly deliver the message that this is feasible. It's feasible on a broad scale. I mean, different hospitals, it's just a matter of standardizing your practice and implementing some best practices. Uh, it's absolutely safe, right? Dirk uh, uh, highlighted this aspect uh, because uh, safety was uh, uncompromised in our registry. And this is not the only data. The data came for also from other studies. Uh, you mentioned the FAST, uh, FAST, FASTAVI, FASTAVI2, the 3M. So this is, uh, uh, I think uh, it's uh, absolutely nowadays the way to go. I think we agree on that, right? So thank you very much for this uh, discussion. Thank you.